Kaylee, we'd like to welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn with the Master Gardeners and Master Naturalists today. Uh, we are um, the University of Illinois Extension, and we serve Bonn, Clinton, Marion, Jefferson, and Washington counties. And we have two Master Gardeners, Master Naturalists, actually both dual roles. We have Diane and Bill with us today, and Sarah Lee's on, and they're gonna help us with some questions um, and answers as anyone jumps on, we'll have some questions and answers, but we have a couple of items that we would like to discuss today. And one of those we'll kind of start off with and kind of show everyone. We had a plant that came in from one of our clients, and so we were looking at it uh, to ID it. Um, she asked for identification. One of the key things that we are going to look at is that we have a square stem on this plant. So it's very square and it has leaves that are thin, but very chewed. And I'm coming in real close, they're, they're chewed. There is no hairs along the stem. There are small flowers that are on little petioles right here and they kind of branch to the side. They have opposite leaves. And then they also have the opposite branching of those flowerets on these little petioles on each side. So we were looking it up and Diane, can you tell them uh, one of the apps that you guys use when you're IDing plants, when you have it not via Zoom on, on, online across the computer, but one that you would have that you use. Could you recommend? Sure, I was gonna say the app is called Seek and it's S-E-E-K um, and it's run by both iNaturalist and the National Geographic. And it does a very good job of, cause I've tried a couple of other of the plant identification ones and it, it, you have the chance of you just, it, it walks you through it very uh, easily. You know, you hit your camera, you try to get, sometimes it'll tell you move your camera a little bit to get different angles. And then finally, there's like six dots that go through the taxonomy of the plant. And when you get to the last one, then you actually have species and uh, it'll let you know you've identified the species. And in addition to helping you identify, they also put out challenges and uh, they uh, will do very specific challenges on a regular basis that you can participate in. I'm, um, I've used it a lot for looking at things in my yard sometimes when I'm not sure if it's a volunteer or if it's a weed. And uh, so I've, I've identified a lot more weeds than plants with it. So I use it as an okay to, to go ahead and, and pull the weeds, so. But it also does birds. It will do uh, lizards, snakes. Um, what else, Bill? No, you don't know. No. Nope. Anyway, it and it it it's really uh, a, a lot more fun, and you can connect it if you already have an iNaturalist account, so you can get your um, observations over there. Thank you for that. Um, Sarah, I know you were keying out as we were kind of talking about the plant. Is there a good book that you like to use um, to key? I have out? tons of I have tons of books, and uh, there's there's good ones that are out there, but I don't happen to have any handy right now. But what I do uh, a lot of times is if you can pick out, you know, when you look at that that weed, if you can pick out the one thing that you notice the most, you know, when you look at it and just go systematically, um, you know, obvious, obviously if you say it's green, that's not going to get you anywhere, <laughs> you know? So, um, but like from what I can see, it's been waving around a lot there and everything, but it, you know, you mentioned the square stem, it's stout and, uh, it looks like the leaves are long and, uh, strap like, and they're sawtoothed, it looks like to me, from, yes. what, from what I saw. But the flower, I couldn't really see what, you know, what that, it, what we were seeing on the flower, what yes. color it is. It, there's really no color to it. Um, Can you break it open it, and um, kind of see what's in there, you know? But generally, if you can 
if you can get the most distinctive characteristics, someone else has already searched and they, so you're trying to think like what a normal, just another normal person out there would see. And then if you put in those keywords, most of the time it'll come up. So, so, if, so if you put in square stem mm -hmm. and opposite leaves, yes. uh, then you'd, you'd it, probably end up in the mint family. Not necessarily. I mean, mints do have a square stem, but it, not all plants with square stems are mints necessarily, but that is a good characteristic. Yeah, and there's sorry, no did, distinct did. smell to it at all either. So that's another okay. thing to kind of, it was right. hard to see. I, at first I thought when I first looked at it, it might be whorehound um, mm -hmm. because it had the opposite leaves and they were kind of skinny and too, mm -hmm. but they did not have the, typically the flower will be um, at the axle there and they didn't have that. It was, you know, where the flower, the florets were right there. They were, they're really on petals. Right. Petals that kind of come up, that little oh, stem yeah. that comes up. But if you look at those teeth, look at them. They're there. That's a sawtooth. Is what that is. So yeah. to me, that sawtooth is the most distinctive of the serrations <laughs> on those on that leaf, that leaf margin. So um, I'll just go ahead and I'll put all that in and see if anything jumps out here. Okay. And then Diane, you were also, you had a couple items that you were going to talk about. Oh, okay. You, if you want to go ahead and do that, one of the questions I got recently was, what is eating my green beans? And um, I was going to say my first response was Japanese beetles because we had Japanese beetles eating our green beans earlier on. But they talked about it and they were having you know, the leaves were being chewed, but not totally skeletonized like a Japanese. I lost her a second. I did too. I, I thought it was me. Um, is she froze up for you? Yeah, she's froze up for me also. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, that was interesting too. I was. I know, it was. So... <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see what I'm getting here. Hmm. Double serrated. Okay. Um. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't want that one. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Tin weeds with thick stalk. Sometimes it takes a little time, but usually you can get there if you just just put in what you see in the way that somebody that in too <laughs> so this is looking like it let's see if i can find out what it is now <clears throat> invasive whatever it is <laughs> yeah and it kind of goes across she said that it it wasn't flowering and it kind of had her stump because it was very invasive and it mm -hmm. went across um it was kind of in a wet part of her um landscape does she have a lot of it um or was it just something where she just what in the world is that <laughs> yeah what in the world is it is really what we kind of were asking uh -huh. so I know, and this was a stumper on, on everyone as we kind of <laughs> come into it. So we were going to look it up. We didn't have to necessarily have it, but we wanted to kind of let people know kind of what we had. Um, we kind of lost Bill and Diane and it, just some of the questions that are coming in right now. Another one was like on our tomato hornworms. Um, you know, right now everyone's picking tomatoes and they have, they're seeing a little bit of damage uh, with our um 
she said that they had a power surge and lost their Wi-Fi. They're working on getting back. So Diane and Bill are, are working on that right now. But as I get the tomato hornworms, they were using UV lights and going out in the evening and actually going to uh, look for the hornworms because they would glow in the evening with the UV lights, the black lights, and they could identify mm -hmm. where the young uh, yep. hornworms were and where they were located at easily. Um, other than, you know, you just go and you see the damage where they've been chewing on the leaves and usually they're on the underside early morning, late evening. Is there any good techniques that you have that you use when you're looking for anything on pest? That's a good one. I know, I hadn't thought about that. I like that. Um, but uh, no, I guess um, like with the tomato, uh, tobacco hornworm, it was always just find them and pull them off because they're so big and obvious. But when they're little, you know, they're not so much. So um, I don't think I have anything any better than that. <laughs> That's a good one. I like it. <laughs> I'm still trying to find this weed. I found the picture, but I can't. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Let's see. Hey, I can... Kathy, I see you've joined us. Yes. Can you see me? Um, I can't see you, but I can see your, your phone is here. Um, we were looking to ID a plant, <laughs> and Sarah's working on that. And we just lost yeah. Diane and Bill. Um, they had a power surge, so they should be coming back on shortly too. Well, I may be, I may be in and out because I'm in Colorado and kind of waiting for grandkids to get back in the car. So I thought I'd tune in. <laughs> well, we were talking about using I, uh, a black light to identify your tomato hornworms um, in the evenings. They were finding those, they would glow. And so they were easily identifiable, especially when they're small. Um, when they're larger, you see more damage on your plant and you can identify them a little easier. But when they're small, sometimes this might be a new technique that everyone can use to try to identify them. That's interesting. I'll let my son know that. <clears throat> Out here in Colorado, he's got about 12 bucket, five gallon buckets full of um, tomatoes. That's about four foot high, but there's tomatoes but there's so much green and I haven't seen any bugs eating on them but um I keep wanting to thin them out like like we were taught and show them the French um the floor or the Florida method method to cage them yeah to kind of weave through them and yeah and prune them that'd be good well I was kind of told to mind my own business because he already <laughs> knows about that stuff <laughs> Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I thought. I think um, Diane's come back with us. Diane, have you joined us again? Yes. I And I apologize. Oh, you're fine. We had a power surge and our Wi Fi went out. So uh -oh. uh, I was going to say, and I didn't know if you got my text or not. We, we were scrambling yeah. around. You got to plug it in. <laughs> no, thank hey, you. We're good. Sarah was talking, we were talking about the tomato hornworm, how they'd use the black light. And then you were talking about your beans. So you want to continue on with your beans about damage? Yeah, but I want to, I want to stay with the uh, uh, greenhorn tomato worms and, and you call it a black light, but we have something that it, they just call it a UV flashlight. Okay. And they're supposed to glow in the dark and yours. And I saw the video online and you can actually see them when they're small, but knock on wood, we haven't had any this no. year. Gosh, I think we've got every other pest in the garden, but that one hasn't showed up yet. So, you know, we have squash bugs, we have uh, green leaf beetles. So I was going to say, I don't know at what point you lost us for the, the you, were, you were looking for damage on your uh, green beans and you okay. thought they were Japanese beetles and then we kind of lost you from there. Oh, yeah, and, and the Japanese beetles were on our beans early. They were skeletonizing it, but these are just, they, they eat bigger holes, but they don't skeletonize the leaf. And then they put little holes in your beans. And the description on extension just says, well, it's really cosmetic damage. Well, I'm sorry, I'm eating those green, <laughs> green beans. It's a little more in cosmetic damage to me. And there's like, you know, they don't just eat one at the tip, you know, then they move an inch and take another little bite. And then they go this way and take another bite. So I, they're pretty bad, but they're reminiscent to me of ladybugs. They're 
about that size. They have four black dots on them sometimes or not, according to the, the research. But the ones we have have four black dots and they're kind of yellowish green. Now I read that they could also be red in color, but that's not what I'm seeing. And I had seen them on the beans and I didn't know what they were and I assumed they were harmless, bad assumption. So uh, now I'm out there and supposedly you can collect them the way you collect a uh, Japanese beetle. Like if you hold a, a thing of water under the plant, you can shake them off and knock them into that. So, but they are, um, I think they could also be in, in a bigger crop, you know, big fields, but as far as a home gardener goes, they really recommend that you try to pick them off like you would a Japanese beetle, so. so Diane, do they look like potato beetles? I don't know what potato beetles, beetles look like. Look How, these are about maybe, three-eighths of an inch long at the biggest. Are they oval or round or long? Kind of, kind of oval. And they've got some black markings on them. And they say the trademark marking is a little triangle at the top of the wings of the beetle. Okay. So, well, but. Uh, okay. Typically well, they're, they're wanting to just do your green beans. Yes, they, for some reason, they specialize in green beans. I think they, um, sometimes their damage would look like what a cucumber beetle looks like, but yeah. I, don't, I don't know cucumber beetles either, so. <coughs> I, don't, I don't have any beans, so I guess I shouldn't worry about it, but I've had them before, and you're right. It's like every half an inch, there's a black spot. Right. And it's, it is unappetizing. Exactly. But I do have to say that I have planted our long beans, our asparagus beans, right yeah. next to bush beans. And the bean leaf beetle doesn't bother those at all. Just another reason to like those beans. Oh, so I cut out here. Are you there? I'm still yeah. here. I'm, I'm oh. there. Hi. Okay. We can see you. We can see well, you. Well, I'm sitting in a hot car in Colorado, and the neighbors here got a air compressor going. So, oh, but I wanted to see smiling faces. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, did you find something? I did, but I, I, I can't find a good enough picture really to to uh, corroborate, but what, what I came up with was common nettle. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm, I, and that I might find be that... definitely with the, the leaves. Right. You know, being there. Mm -hmm. That's what came up though. And I, the leaves look, you know, hold it up again. I want to see them again. The leaf, yeah. Right. The, this is probably the best one. Let me see here if I can see. Mm -hmm. It's such a big old the all the the uh, okay. this one's kind of colored discolored. So, so yeah. would that leaf be about three inches long? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like it. It, it's maybe a little longer. Yeah, it's just hard to. I don't have anything relative to it. To... Yeah, uh, I was looking for my ruler. Now that you said that, oh. I don't know that I have a ruler right here. Next to me. Um, Use your pinky a sharpie. Pinky. Here, let's, uh, Use, we can your put pinky it up next pinky. to the sharpie. So actually, it's it's almost as long as the sharpie. Oh, so that's more like four or five oh. inches. Yeah. yeah, that's bigger than I thought. It's Ooh. it is almost the same length as the sharpie. Wow. So and that's towards the base. Now as it tapers up. Um, they get much smaller at the top, of course. And and we didn't have the whole plant. They just broke it off and brought a piece in. So it, it's hard sometimes that, you know, to ID just because we we get pieces that are in, they're in a bag and, you know, they've been kind of smashed. You know, it's, it's pretty closed up on itself, which is hard to tell too. 
um, mm -hmm. just because it's going through. But as we kind of go through, you know, it's just, it, you can kind of see how everyone that who uses uh, extension office kind of brings it in. Uh, Sometimes they'll bring a bug in also, and it'll be oops. in a bag and they'll just bring it in to the Ziploc bag to mm -hmm. one of the ID. So that's some of the can services that we provide. <laughs> yeah, what does the base of that leaf look like on that plant? Um, actually the, the mm -hmm. base, here's, let's see if I can show you maybe a little better picture. This one's kind of winged out. You can kind of see it goes right. They're opposite on, on this right. side. It can, well, actually, it's actually it, it's kind of strange. It's it's this way, and then it turns, and see the okay. Has, so then it turns it again. So it has a it has with, a flat, and then it flips to one eighty degrees, and then it flips back, and then it flips again. Oh, interesting. Would you say it's heart shaped? Would you say it's heart shaped? Heart shaped at the bottom, at the base of the leaf. I um, couldn't see it because you wouldn't hold it still. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. I know. Um, I don't. I don't know that it's heart shaped. No, I don't think so. But here's the description. Okay. Um, leaf length, uh, three to six inches. Leaf width, one to three inches. Leaf description, one to six inch. Simple, opposite, sawtooth margin. Egg-shaped green leaves, that's not good. They're not egg-shaped, really. But um, it's just, it, it would have a, a pointed tip and then a square stem, but they're not hairy, right? Correct. So, okay. Well, that's funny because all of the searches are coming to this, but I don't think that's what it is. So I'm gonna keep going. Carry on. <laughs> That was, that was close, but let's see. Did they see whether it was growing in a dry area or a wet they area? They said it was a little wet, but it had just rained. So I don't know when they brought it in. I'm not, sh you know, if that's really fair assessment on that, you know, on, on where it's at. And did they say how tall the entire plant was? She did not. They, they just left it with our office support and she had said they just broke the top of it off and um she said can you id this and That's that was all she said and she goes i want to know where the flower it is which it really isn't having any blooms that's colored right now they're everything's green so yeah it just kind of sometimes we have mystery flowers and they come in and, and we work through the plants and try to id that when we can but this was a stumper uh typically there there's something you know very common that we're used to seeing this is a little different we this is really yeah. uncommon uh, when you, you when you bring it in could, and and could it be that somebody has a um you know it might have been somebody's house plant that got outside it might you know, have, like, uh, I mean, it, it's definitely not a common, it's, I don't believe it's native. Um, you know, I, I would say that it's, you know, more of an exotic type of one. At first I thought it might be, um, and Sarah, I thought it might be South Hill um, or Hill all because they have uh, square stems and they're in the mint family, but typically they have a purple bloom and mm -hmm their their leaf of their their shapes a little more like you said a little more of that oval shape than such a long narrow shape leaf so um but that's pretty common that you know having that self heal and and they'll have a, a bloom that's kind of like that with a little bit of purple bloom to it so the the bloom kind of is that same shape as it comes out but it's purple instead and this being you know immature yet it's hard to identify just from the bloom Right. Yeah. Say, well, while while Sarah's um, looking, one one of the things that I wanted to talk <laughs> about, and I I don't have the answer, and that is about house plants in the kind of heat wave that we're having right now. You know, typically they say for your house plants they shouldn't get above ninety degrees, and you know, right now we're facing upper nineties and 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 the heat wave warning. And so I've been debating whether to bring my plants at least to move them into the garage where it's a little cooler than out on the porch. 
they're in the total shade and I'm watering them more than I normally would, which you should for any potted plant in this kind of heat. But I'm, I'm wondering, sh should I try to bring them inside? I have an aloe plant and I thought it wasn't looking very good. So I picked it up and it started to chirp at me. And I only <laughs> dropped the plant and a big toad jumped out. And oh I, had no, I had no idea that toads could chirp. I thought that chir toads only croaked. So we actually went online to say, what does a toad sound like? And that was one of the sounds that they had a recording of. And it's, it was the funniest noise. I'm just like, wait a minute. And, I, you know, a couple yeah, of weeks that, ago, that toad is probably still talking about it. <laughs> I said that I was probably still talking about it. <laughs> so, but, so obviously that plant's not coming inside, even not even into the garage, uh, because I don't know if the big toad has little toads in the, in the plant with it, but uh, I, I don't know. It, do, do people bring plants inside when it gets this hot? They do. Well, and you then, know, um, let's her. Go, Sarah. I'm sorry. Say, uh, you know, people people obsess about cold uh, limitations, but they don't think a lot about about heat limitations. So that is a really good concern and an excellent question. And um, normally speaking, uh, unless something comes from a severe severely hot, routinely hot area, then ge a general rule of thumb is if it gets above 100 degrees, then what happens is they go into a quiescent type of a, a state. It's not really dormancy because it's not anything that's genetically programmed, uh, whereas dormancy is something that it's a response to the seasons and it's kind of routinely so am I losing you yet? <laughs> but it's, it's something that is expected. But when plants are faced with extreme environmental crises, they become quiescent. And that means that they stop all of their, uh, their operations, basically. And they're able to kind of go into what is almost like a dormancy. But it's, it's just that they shut down. They shut down what they're trying to do so that they won't um, die basically. And then when they come back, they resume their operations and go on. Well, the trouble with your house plant is it cannot cease operations. So it, it's not going to have the capability to become quiescent, um, for very long. Usually they say if it, if it keeps on for a, a protect, protracted time, um, maybe, uh, five or six days, then it can do irreparable damage, you know, to your plant. So my, my feeling on it would be, of course, water is critical, but with the heat uh, problem, I would bring it in somewhere where it's not so hot. So the short answer is yes, I would bring them in because that's going to be, if it goes on for very many days, it's going to be too much for that plant to uh, not stay in business, I guess, basically. They've got to be, you know, operating on a regular basis. They've got to be photosynthesizing and, and doing what they do or it, it, it can cause permanent damage, so. Okay. Um, so every it, plant, it, recommend I don't know bringing them in in the evening or in really... the morning? I'm sorry, would you recommend bringing them in to the house more in the evening? Sorry, or you're breaking up. What? Let me turn off the video. Let's see here. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Now, what did you say? I'm sorry. Would you recommend those houseplants to come in like in the evening, like after they've been through the heat of the day, bring them in that evening or first thing in the morning before the heat actually starts? Um, well, Probably, uh, well, there's another thing that's going on is overnight, there actually, there's some issues with uh, 
you know, plants turn their process around during the day. They um, expel uh, carbon dioxide, you know that, but they sort of turn that around and they do something different overnight. So um, generally speaking, they're probably all right overnight, but it's during the day where I think they're gonna, they're gonna be uh, stressed, you know, for want of a better word to try to try to operate. So I don't know if you could just bring them in till it's over with or, <laughs> you know, and just then just take them back out after, um, I think on the weekend, it's supposed to cool off. Yeah. Right. So right. yeah, but uh, if you've got a place where, because at this point, even, um, you know, not having light would be a, be a better option than being this hot. So right. even if the light isn't very good, they're going to be better off at, you know, without it, because when they're so hot, they can't do anything anyway. You know, they just, their, their uh, system operations are just going to shut down for a while. And that go with, they go with that quiescence. So that's just my opinion. So the short answer is yes, I would <laughs> get them someplace where they're not so dang hot. <laughs> yeah. I just think, and I think you're right about that, that people don't pay attention that heat can be so destructive. You know, everybody's sensitive to how cold it is, but I think plants the same way people, you know, think about the people that died out in Oregon with the excessive heat. And I think the same could be said for house plants. You know, some of the plants that grow outside, they're used to it. But uh, the house plants, you know, because I've got a few plants I didn't even put outside because they're kind of sensitive to uh, temperature variations. So. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a, a few years ago, we had a protracted uh, period of um, heat like this. I don't remember what year it was, but it was up in the up in the hundreds. Um, and we lost so many of the uh, conifers that were climbed for, uh, you know, a cooler climate. And it's particularly a problem with an evergreen because they literally have to be in operation 24 seven. And, you know, and 365 days a year, and they cannot go for very many days, you know, like that because their operations shut down. At least the, uh, at least the deciduous plants, they can, you know, <laughs> they can um, kind of shut it down and come back. But, but you know, your your conifers and then your sensitive house plants, they just don't have that capability. They just can't do it. They don't. They're not. They're not genetically programmed for it. So. Going back to the ID of your plant, Chris, uh -huh. I think Bill's found it. Has he found it? He's been working? What? Yeah. what? Tell us. <laughs> there is a plant and they call it culantro, you know, and it is C-U-L-A-N-T-R-O. And on Etsy, they are selling seeds for this sawtooth herb. And then they call it N-G-O with a little character above the O and then G-A-I. Huh. And take a look at the picture, but the picture real of this culantro, it's a tropical perennial herb. And it's uh, other names are Mexican coriander, sawtooth coriander, and this gano guy or I don't know how they would say it. It looks Vietnamese to me, but uh, I'm not seeing the sawtooth. Am I? Oh, wait a minute. I, I see gonna... one now. Yeah. 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 And it looks very, very similar. No. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It does, does yours have hairs out on the end of the the uh, spines I've got a bunch what I'm of seeing does yeah I've got a bunch of different pictures but the ones that identify it as Vietnamese and um are um look very very similar and there's even like a um I don't know if I can uh, I don't know 
gonna have to get up and find my weed book, I guess. <laughs> what do you think? Can you see this, Sarah? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was looking for my book. Okay, what are we? This um, is the found of the Coulantra. There you go. So it'll come up. Yeah, there you go. No, see, those teeth are different. They're not the same teeth. Besides, you know, you have to stop and think, if this is a tropical plant, why would it be here <laughs> too? You be know here. what I'm saying? Oh, sure. <laughs> as possible. Somebody threw seeds out. Bet it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. But you said the little flowers haven't opened up yet, right, Chris? Yeah, nothing has opened up. Oh, here we go. Oh, so wow. another one. Uh, they they also could it possibly be like a and it's kind of rare around, but wild basil is another one that they had. They kind of had that tooth. Um, but it's not sawtooth, it just has tooth leaves. So I know, see, it kind of stumps us. Sometimes it's really easy to find, and sometimes you have to kind of go through the key. You know, um, my problem is that I, I am apparently a lazy bum that will not finish putting things away after my remodeling. So my books are like a mess. They... I don't know where anything is. Half of them are upstairs, half of them are downstairs. And when this guy built some shelves and he just took them out and then he stuck them all back in willy nilly. Some are upside down, some are, you know, I don't know. But I will find it and I will get it. I will figure out what that puppy is. But I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what I was even talking about. But I've got a really good weed ID book somewhere and I also have those little uh those little um tags that you can take out but sometimes you know that's a good point that sometimes yeah. you know a weed is not a normal one that you see although you have to stop and ask yourself if it's a tropical Vietnamese plant why is it here <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, a, lot you of, a lot of the invasives sometimes are you know native to Asia or to Europe mm -hmm. and and they end up being yeah kind of weeds to us you know they're not yeah. the, the conservation factor on them are you know is really you know low you know in that sense that they're just you know it's like okay they're not very yeah. beneficial they're in disturbed areas and things like that so if we had that flower that sure would help if we could get a flower i'm looking at field mini crests right now I yeah, that's not it. I know. And that's the sad part. It, it's it, like I said, everything's very immature. So there's no distinct color um, that you can kind of do, um, you know, as you're kind of going down them. Um, and you took the leaves and crushed them to uh, get a smell. Well, let's try that again. Let's see. No nope. smells like leaves. No, no distinct smell. So, I know you had said before, like nettle is kind of in that family. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another one, a motherwort it is one that's in there, but I, I think their leaves are a little different, aren't they? Where they're, mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of different, you know, family or in a family that you think, oh, it's a square stem. So that's an easy ID, which we've, we've come to learn is not necessarily an easy ID. <laughs> it is, you know, it is a, a little bit, sometimes you have to kind of work through it and, and work through all the, all the different steps and everything. But so is there any other pests that you have, Diane, in your garden that um, the viewers might be able to, to have and, and recognize or deal with right now? I would say squash bugs is really the big one. And, and that one um, is really hard to deal with. And we started early and very um, just Method methodically going out every morning and every evening looking for them early on. And really uh, were able early in the season to catch a lot of the adult ones before they started with the multi-generations. 
but the squash bugs lay these little golden eggs. And I always thought they were just under the leaves, but this season we're seeing them as well on top of the leaves. And then if it's not the, the eggs that you're trying to get rid of, then there's all the different stages of, of growth. And when they're really small, they almost look like little tiny flies after they hatch. And they, they call them nymphs and they're like a light gray color. And then if you don't manage to get all of those squashed, they grow into this little light colored, about a half inch little bug that scampers very, very fast. And then lastly, they grow into the adult squash bugs that to me look similar to a, a stink bug. The best way to catch them is early in the morning or in the evening, because like Japanese beetles, they're very slow. And like a Jack Japanese beetle, you can just throw them in a container with water and a little bit of soap. And it's not like they're coming back out at you uh, but you just have to keep going and going. And as the season goes on, they, and they very much like zucchini. So anybody who has zucchini, if uh, there's a couple of things that could get your zucchini, but squash bugs, which I never saw when I lived up by Chicago, seem to be endemic to this area. And once they're done with your squash, and we even plant butternut squash, which they're not, not supposed to be as bothered by squash bugs. I think that's an overstatement because they're going, they're going after our, our zucchini and our, and our butternut squash. And when they're done with those, they move over to the cantaloupe right. and start going after the cantaloupe as well. So we can kind of tell when they're there, we start seeing yellow leaves and then you just got to start checking the plants and checking and checking but i don't think i've gone out to the to the squash patch ever this year without finding either eggs or nymphs or adults or all three of them but the best thing to do is catch them early and try to control them because once they start reproducing they are like rabbits or worse than rabbits almost so, and they might even start seeing them going to their pumpkins if they planted late pumpkins. Um, they might be seeing those kind of going on those also this time of year. Wow, I was going to say, and everything I have seen and read basically says that the best way to control them is to keep capturing the adult bugs and scraping off the eggs before they can hatch. So, but. It, it, you know, the bigger the plants get and the more the vines go out, it gets harder and harder to, to find them, which is why if you can kind of get them under control early, you may have a chance of getting some squash. So right now our butternut squash is setting on and okay. uh, we've got a bunch of plants out there that are maybe six, eight inches already. So... Well, good, and it sounds like you have really taken measures to control all the insects the best you can, so. Yes, but then, you know, you get company and you get distracted or something else happens and then you go back out and say, oh no, I've lost a couple of days here. So, no. I, squash bugs, I, I, I can deal with a squash burr. I, to me, they don't reproduce as rapidly and once you find them, you can cut the stem open, dig out the grub, cover it up. The zucchini will re-root again and you'll be okay. But uh, it's almost like the squash bugs come from one end uh, out at the leaves and the squash burrs start at the roots. So it's a wonder people get zucchini here. <laughs> Well, and everyone talks about having so many. I think it's, you know, the other goal is to kind of either plant a lot, like they say, or to rotate that, you know, harvest that where you don't plant them, you know, that you skip a year planting squash and then you, you know, go that, that third year and plant again. And maybe that might break that cycle a little bit. Ooh, that's an interesting idea. Just yeah, not do that, they'll do that sometimes in the big pumpkin fields. Um, is that they'll every third year they'll let it set, and that way they they don't plant, um, and they kind of can control it a little bit that way. So, 
Speaking of planting, can you do a second crop of zucchini? You know, like as a fall crop? Because I've never seen that listed on the fall crop list. I think it's, it depends on how many days to maturity. So you'd have to look at which variety you have. Um, I mean, you're getting into August. So if you have maturity dates that are under the 60 days, you might be able to squeeze it in, you know, and get some smaller ones. Um, it may not produce multiple times, but I think, you know, it, it depends on your maturity rates and your packages probably would be able to tell you exactly. Um, I right. actually the I have one right here at my desk. Let's see what it says. It says 57 days to harvest. So this one is just a black um, zucchini. It says Fort Hood, Fort Hood zucchini. And it's saying on the back, 57 days to maturity to harvest so, so i mean you're pushing it you know you're you're getting in if you go to your frost date if we have an october 15th frost date which is right. typical um then you you should be okay you know if you get an early plant it this week um you'll you'll be fine but if you wait it, it might get in you know if we would have an early you know hard frost and and i think um you know it depends on the, the maturity of the leaves too. If they're still tender, you're going to have a, a harder frost. You'll have more damage with it. So just okay. kind of pushing that. I was going to say, we are trying a new vegetable this year and it's fennel, but it's the bulb fennel. Now we planted the fennel that produces the seeds, but I really wanted the fennel where you could dig up the bulb and, and roast it. And I heard that it does better in cooler weather. So I, planted it as a for a fall crop and then we get this heat wave and I'm crossing my fingers that the the plants that like cooler weather are going to make it through this heat wave but I'm out there watering them twice a day so and they're just you know just they're real guys. Small. <laughs> so we'll see you might um you know give them a little water on their leaves too. Um, I mean, that can kind of cut down on the transpiration too. My, my late husband used to call that love. <laughs> of course, you have to watch out, you know, in the bright sun that'll, that can burn the leaves too, you know, those right. water droplets kind of, but, you know, if you, if, if sun's not too bright, that can kind of, kind of help. I noticed too, uh, when I was mowing the grass, you know, when you mow grass, if you see the tracks where your your wheels have been, then you know that it's dry. You know, that's a sign that the, the turf is dry. And it, with all this rain we've had, it's amazing that that could be the case, but there it is, you know, it's it's uh, kind of deceptive um, when it gets this hot. It's like things just aren't, they don't, you know, they're not what you're used to, it's not normal. But I know on the golf course, that's what they look for is, is they look for when the, you know, the grounds crew is out mowing. If you can see where the tires have gone, they know they're, they need to do something. Water the lawn. <laughs> I'm still looking. Those patches that we kind of go. Uh, another thing with all the wet and a, and a brief little rain showers, we've heard more of your slime molds um, being more prevalent this year in kind of the mulch area. So um, you, you kind of have those where they, they kind of build up and you, you're seeing more of those um, mulch having you know mold on them and, and different um you know different species kind of coming up with it and and one of those we've seen they had like um they'll call it the angel ring uh sarah you can probably talk about that too fairy, fairy rings yeah fairy rings whenever the oh. they see the mushrooms coming up in a circle like a circular shape yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and that's a lot that's a big lawn issue too um yeah but again it's an environmental response there's not really much you can do about it <clears throat> um i don't know if you remember that year uh in the 90s when we had all that flooding there was every we had a mushroom book and there was every kind of mushroom that there was in that book <laughs> we found every single one of them things you know so you can kind of expect that you know i think um 
I'm gonna have to go dig out my book. My books, <laughs> you've spurred me on here. <laughs> this is making me crazy. So I can actually, actually can key it out. But you said that it didn't have hairs, right? Correct. You said it was, it was smooth. It didn't have any hairs, right? It's smooth. I, I, are you talking? I can't hear you. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's smooth, so it's it's glabrous. Uh huh. Right. And it's um it. There's really no no hair even on the on the leaves. There's mm -hmm. there's really not. Like I said, the only difference is that it's um opposite leaves, but then they they kind of turn, which is kind of a, a weird mm -hmm. where they turn one eighty, and then they go up and on as they alternate up the stem. Mm -hmm. so I may have to bring this by and drop it off at your house on the way home and let you <laughs> look through the oh, key too where are you where are you at well I'm at Salem today okay. but at oh, the yeah, office. Salem. don't forget Gloria's name tag oh yeah I'll grab that too Gloria her name tag yes <laughs> I was going to remind you I'll have to have a party and give that thing to her. <laughs> no, absolutely. We should just have a party. <laughs> so do you guys have anything else? Everybody. Do you have any other questions on anything or have you had any questions come in um, about any plant or insect that you want to discuss before we go? Not I. How nope. about you, Bill? I do not. I, I don't think so. I uh, I just want to say that um, that I got I've had a, a little bit of a rodent issue in my garage, and um, I think it was just simply one mouse that was doing all the damage. But and I caught the one mouse, but I put mouse traps down, and I had old ones, and so. I decided I needed to buy new mouse traps, and the new mouse trap is awful. Um, I have you have you seen them where they've got that plastic like landing um, area on these mouse traps? <laughs> and I my uh, index finger on my left hand is so beat up from that mouse trap <laughs> because that the the holder would not hold that thing, and I kept trying to get it to, you know, go, and it just wasn't going to work. But um, so the they tried to make a better mouse trap and it didn't work. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I think when they needed to stick to the old design, but um, I was going to ask because I think I'm going to have to get serious about the moles in my yard. Um, they're bad this year. I know. What do you all do for moles? What seriously? I mean, do you trap them? Do you poison them? What do you What do you do? What they do around us is get the mole uh, traps that are, you know, you push them into the ground with your foot and it kills uh, the mole when, uh, when they trigger it. So that's the most effective that I've heard of. Now I know that- um, You don't have to. What's that? It's not something, you, you leave the trap and it works with you not being there. Is that what Correct. you're saying? Yes. Well, that's good. That's good because I'm not going to stand out there and wait for a mole. <laughs> right. Apparently. No, because what they they tell you to do is find the run where the moles are going, and then step mm -hmm. it down. And if it gets pushed up again, you know it's an active run, and that's where you you and these things they just kind of slide into the ground, and you just you mm -hmm. literally step on them to push them into where that active run is. And uh, you'll be able to tell if uh, you get a, a mole in there. Yeah. But uh, um, no, we do you get those able... at Lowe's? Yeah, you should be able to get that at Lowe's or Plant Land or mm -hmm. um, Tractor Supply. Tractor Supply, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, we did I guess I. Who had uh, uh, what he considered to be a serious problem. And he ended up hiring somebody, an exterminator, to come out 
And he actually used uh, carbon dioxide gas that he pumped into the, the runs to try and kill the moles mm. that way. So there's a, a number of different ways you can approach it, but that's nothing that I'd recommend anybody try to do on their own unless they really know what they're doing. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, duly noted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll look for those because it's the my side yard is just well of course it's under the linden the the basswood tree because that's where all the the grubs are because of the you know the Japanese beetles so it makes sense but I I uh, you know I've had a some joint replacements and I'm not supposed to fall down but I was out there trying to do something in the night and I tripped over one of them and fell down really hard, you know, oh, and I'm, they're just everywhere. So I, I said, you know, I'm either going to have to curtail my uh, activities or get rid of the moles. Something's got to happen. Another suggestion would so be, I will if try you, that. Thank you. If you know anybody who's got a small terrier or a corgi, borrow it for a couple of weeks. <laughs> let, let it loose. Yeah, we have they wouldn't neighbor. get suspicious one. if I went to the shelter, would they? <laughs> <laughs> you could <can> ask. <laughs> Maybe not. Well, thank you guys for joining us today and, and answering some of our questions and trying to help us out with some ideas and, and what's going on in our garden or our plants. Um, we'll, we'll continue to next time, I guess, and we'll try to figure out this a plant ID of, of what we're looking at. Um, we're getting closer at least with it. So that's, that's good. Giving us some ideas. And again, we appreciate you guys taking time today to talk to us and, and give us some helpful tips, um, to use in our garden. So thank you, Diane and Bill and Sarah and Kathy. I think she, she kind of cut out on us. I think she left. Um, she's traveling right now. So we appreciate everybody taking time today. So thank you. Ooh, it was great fun and we learned a lot. And Sarah, I want to hear what it is. I know. Just bring that that uh, sample by and I'll figure it out. Okay. I think I need good. to look at it though. Yeah, and it is enough. easier. It's hard to ID over video, and, and that's the trouble I had with pictures sometimes. It's hard to ID, so. And probably if I go out in the field, it's probably out there, <laughs> you know. I mean, there's just so many weeds, and I know, um, you know, that's a, that's a whole science in and of itself to know all the weeds. So um, most of the time, you just you just relearn them all the time as you come up against them. And then you want to kick yourself when it turns out to be something so obvious, like, you know, and, and sometimes they look different too, depending on where they're at in their life. Like if it's a biennial, you know, they, the first year they're just a little thing by on the ground. And then the next year they shoot up. So bring it to me. I'll, I'll figure it out. Sounds good. Thank you.